This first session is about Standard Chartered as a bank, their financing of fossil fuel companies, and examples of the devastating impact set projects are having. Talking about these topics now will be Hefa Schücking, Director of Urgewald, and Jerry Aranthes, Director of Center for Energy, Ecology, and Development in the Philippines. And with that, I will leave the floor to the speakers. So today we're going to talk about Standard Chartered's fossil business. Standard Chartered is the 44th largest bank in the world. And while it's headquartered in the UK, most of its business is actually elsewhere. It's a global bank and its most important markets are in emerging economies, especially in Asia and in Africa. 68% of Standard Chartered's income comes from Asia. 17% comes from Africa and the Middle East. Only 11% come from Europe and America. So over 80% of Standard Chartered's income comes from emerging markets. Out of the UK banks, Standard Chartered is best comparable to HSBC in terms of its business model. Both banks have a strong Asia focus, but HSBC is much bigger than Standard Chartered. So you can think of Standard Chartered as a kind of little sister of HSBC with both banks competing in the same markets. Other important competitors for Standard Chartered are of course domestic banks in the various countries it operates in. Here you can see the size of the UK banks we've been focusing on in this webinar series. In terms of its assets, Barclays is about twice as big as Standard Chartered, and HSBC is almost four times as big. Now, the CEO of Standard Chartered is Bill Winters. Bill Winters originally started his career at JP Morgan, and he became CEO of Standard Chartered in 2015. And there's no signs that this is going to change anytime soon. Of all the three UK banks we've talked about so far, um, they're all trying to green their image. Um, if you look at their web page pages or their sustainability reports. But if you compare the presentations that banks make to uh, investors where they're hoping to raise money, uh, whom, whom they're hoping to raise money from through roadshows, then they don't often talk that much about sustainability. Standard Chartered is kind of an exception here. And if you look at their roadshow material, you get the impression that sustainability is taken a bit more seriously at the top level of the bank. This quote here is from Bill Winters, and you don't often hear this kind of statement in these types of presentations. Now, Standard Chartered's central advertising claim is, we're here for good. Um, let's take a closer look and see whether this bears up. To scrutiny. Just last month, Rainforest Action Network, BankTrack, and Reclaim Finance and other NGOs published a report that examines financing for over 2,000 fossil fuel companies since the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement. According to this report, 35 commercial banks have funneled US dollars 2.7 trillion into the fossil fuel industry over the past four years. And what's especially worrying here when you look at this graph is that financing to the fossil fuel industry has been increasing since Paris. Now, where is Standard Chartered in all this? Standard Chartered is the 12th largest European financier of fossil fuels and provided over 24 billion US dollars to fossil companies since 2016. And if you take a closer look at the numbers over the years, you'll see the same general tendency that Standard Chartered's fossil business has grown enormously since Paris. But I also wanna share some research that Orgavault has done to uncover who has been financing um, coal plant developers over the past three years. So companies that are still planning or uh, developing new coal plants. 
here are the numbers. And if you look at them, they're pretty amazing for Standard Chartered that they're, um, that they're placed first in terms of UK financial institutions supporting coal plant developers. If you consider that they're much smaller than either HSBC or Barclays. And if we take a closer look at which coal plant developers Standard Chartered is invested in, um, you'll see that these companies, um, if you combine all of their plans, they actually want to build 118 gigawatt of new coal-fired capacity. That's as much as the entire operating coal plant fleets of Japan, Germany, and Poland combined. In the meantime, however, Standard Chartered has made the following announcement and has committed to stopping all project finance for new coal plants. This is good and laudable, but unfortunately, it only solves a small part of the problem. And I'll explain why. If you watched our webinar last Tuesday, you might remember that we talked about how many coal plants are actually not financed through project finance, but are financed through general corporate loans or through corporate bond and share issues. So Standard Chartered's commitment to drop project finance, it only actually would only take out 500 million of the 8.5 billion it has been providing to coal plant developers. So with 8 billion US dollars, it could go on supporting these companies. Now let's make it concrete. You've all heard about Adani, the Indian company that wants to build a new coal terminal on the Great Barrier Reef, develop one of the world's largest coal mines in Queensland, Australia, and build two huge new coal plants in India. Adani is one of the most controversial coal companies in the world, and people are protesting against it, not only in Australia and in India, but all over. Here's a major piece that ran in the New York Times last year on, on Adani. Now, Standard Chartered gave Adani general corporate loans of US dollars 750 million over the past three years, and also underwrote bond issues for Adani in value of over 330 million US dollars. So Standard Chartered has channeled over 1 billion US dollars to this company. Now Standard Chartered has a second part to its new coal policy, and let's see what that does and how it applies to Adani. Here are the central elements of Standard Chartered's policy. At first glance, I was happy to read that it talks about financial services. Financial services in this case means it also covers corporate lending and it covers underwriting of share and bond issues. The problem comes up when you look at the next line where Standard Chartered says, we will stop providing services to these clients from 2021 onwards if they are less um, <clears throat> if they are a hundred percent dependent on thermal coal now if you think back in february royal bank of scotland they came out with a policy saying we are immediately going to cut out clients who are more than 15 percent reliant on revenues from thermal coal and royal bank of scotland they committed to bringing that threshold down to zero by 2030. if you look down at the bottom of this slide you'll see that standard chartered is committing to bring it down to 10 percent by 2030. Now, the problem arises when you go back and you think about Adani. The thing with Adani is it's not 100% reliant on revenue from thermal coal. This means the company will not be divested from Standard Chartered's portfolio in next year. 
The thing about Adani is that they're a big conglomerate and they also have income from agribusiness. Um, they're involved with uh, uh, defense production. They're, uh, they have real estate. This means that Standard Chartered can probably go on financing Adani over the next five years, which is the exact time frame in which Adani is massively investing in new coal infrastructure. In its advertising, Standard Chartered says, the choices you make in the next five years will determine your next 10. But Adani's new coal plants and mines, they are being built to operate for decades. Here for good, the choices Standard Chartered is making today will affect everyone's future for the worse. Thank you. Jerry will now talk more about issues that arise with Standard Chartered in the Philippines. Standard Chartered is a major financier of new coal plants coming up in the Philippines, not through project finance, but by providing corporate finance to companies that are behind those coal plants. So the country is a, is a, it's a rich country in terms of biodiversity, good beaches, lovely beaches, uh, rich in biodiversity, but also at the center of the climate crisis. Um, in 2013, it was a poster boy. Everyone was shocked with uh, the devastation. So it's supposed to be a leader in terms of, you know, facing out uh, the main cause because of its potential for renewable energy. But to the contrary, renewable energy has been in decline in the country. And coal has been a major key uh, component in terms of the exp overall expansion. In 2010, uh, 16 new coal plants uh, started operation. So it has basically outstripped uh, renewable energy in the country with a vast potential with around 250 gigawatt, which is 10 times the current capacity of uh, the energy or the power mix in the country. That is not only our problem because there is still 12 gigawatt of new coal plants that are in the pipeline. Uh, it's basically a 130% increase of the current coal capacity in the country. Based on Urgivald's research uh, recently, last year, uh, the Philippines' coal expansion is ninth in the whole world. So even though it's just 12 gigawatt, it's, uh, it's a big expansion in terms of very small country compared globally. The bad news about this is that based on new studies, the coal buildup will actually cause uh, 27,000 Filipinos prema with premature deaths due to air pollution from burning of this fossil fuel. And it will also further exacerbate uh, the high cost of electricity in the country, we're second highest in Southeast Asia. In the whole world, we're actually uh, second to Japan in terms of commercial uh, and residential uh, electricity rates. At the same time, it is also a problematic uh, source where in, in 2019 alone, we experienced 60 instances of low reserves because of the heat in the summer where in coal plants usually overheat and conks because of the lack of water and uh, boilers tends to be more problematic when it's hotter in summer. Uh, remember that the Philippines is below the equator, so it's more summerly uh, in terms of the temperature. But that's not just the issue with, with coal plants in the country. Uh, a lot of human rights and land rights violations have been witnessed since 2010. There are already around more than 10 environmental defenders who are fighting against coal projects in the Philippines that have been murdered. Last year, we outstripped the uh, Latin American countries in terms of deaths uh, and murdered uh, land rights and environmental uh, defenders. So we're not proud of that, but it, you can imagine the, uh, the problems that communities and campaigners are facing in terms of resisting these coal projects. But who are behind this coal expansion and development in, in the country? There are at least 
five major companies in the country that are in the power sector, but a few of them are actually at the forefront in terms of the whole expansion. And here I'll talk about uh, San Miguel Corporation. In the country, it's famous not of the coal plants, but they're the number one beer in the country. So you can imagine how hard it is to run a campaign against San Miguel Corporation. But it's the biggest in terms of the proposed coal plant projects that are in the pipeline out of the 12 gigawatt expansion. So San Miguel has at least four existing coal plants that were built and have been acquired recently in the last couple of years, uh, around five to six years. What is problematic is that they are the biggest in terms of coal expansion in the country. They're the top expansionist uh, in the country. They occupy a large chunk of the 12 gigawatt that are in the pipeline. Around seven new coal-fired power plants are being planned and being pushed by San Miguel Corporation with around almost five gigawatts. So almost half, around 45% of the total expansion in the country is pushed by San Miguel Corporation uh, with uh, an existing more or less three gigawatt of coal uh, that are operating. And here, a standard charter clearly provides the impetus in terms of the expansion that is being pushed by San Miguel Corporation. Around $826 million are, were provided by Standard Charter in terms of loans and underwriting to top frontier investment holdings, which owns uh, San Miguel uh, Corporation, around 60% of the shares. So Standard Charter plays a very critical role in terms of the overall coal expansion being promoted by San Miguel. I'll talk about three key projects that are being resisted and have impacts currently in the country. One is a coal plant that, it's one of the oldest coal plants. Uh, it was refurbished in 2013 through a loan from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, it was previously owned by a U.S. company, uh, wherein recently was acquired by San Miguel Corporation. So it's a very old coal plant. They just retrofitted it and refurbished it. But it's one of the very polluted uh, coal plants in the country because it uses the old, one of the oldest technologies. Those that are being read out in developed countries are being used in our country, such as this project. Many issues in terms of pollution, of course, with communities, fisher folks, the loss of livelihood because of lowering of fish catch because of the pollution to the uh, seascape. But the key issue here, quite recently, is the instability of the supply of electricity because it's, these are old coal plants. So most of the time, just like last summer, wherein uh, there was a, a lot of rotating brownouts caused by unstable power from this kind of coal plants. The second one is quite famous in the Philippines because it is like a poster boy in terms of what could a coal plant do to a community. There has been massive pollution issues and in 20, around 2016 to 2017, the last quarter of 2016 to the early quarter of 2017, this has been investigated by a government agency on the environmental agency because of reports of violations in terms of air pollution. Massively, there has been many cases of impacts to children and residents in terms of skin diseases. The level of the cases of upper respiratory diseases and other related pollution-induced illnesses have risen in quite a lot of communities around uh, the coal plant in Limay, Bataan. This is also the uh, province wherein one of the first environmental defenders were murdered. Gloria Capitan has been against the coal plant uh, ever since, uh, has been against two of the coal plants of San Miguel Corporation in this province. Uh, she was gunned down uh, in broad daylight in front of her family, and she was one of uh, the first martyrs of the anti-coal resistance in the country. The third one 
is not yet built. It's 300 megawatt in the so-called, uh, what we call right now as the renewable energy capital of the Philippines. It is supplying around almost 98% of renewable energy from the plants that are in uh, the island of Negros. But San Miguel is hell-bent in pushing for the establishment of a coal plant in one of the cities, which is touted as the cleanest and environmentally friendliest city in the country. And there has been a lot of reports in terms of harassments because in the country we're in, it's mostly countryside and the uh, rural elites, has, we call them hacienderos, are quite influential in terms of politics, in terms of the way of life of most of the citizens because they own almost all the lands, all the, the uh, establishments. Uh, so it's, it's quite difficult to go against a particular project that is harmful. So a lot of cases of political and incidents of harassment have been reported uh, in, in this area. The project hasn't gotten any environmental permits, but as you can see in the picture, there's already land clearing for uh, the eventual setting up coal plant. Uh, also, it's right beside the sea. It is a protected area, protected marine area, because it's very rich. There are dolphins. The marine biodiversity is so rich in that area. It's called uh, the Tanyon Strait. Uh, a lot of uh, projects were banned there, but the San Miguel Corporation is still hell-bent in establishing a coal plant right beside a protected area in Negros. So today, however, there are developments proving that defeating coal is possible in the country. Uh, so it's not just bad stories uh, in the Philippines in terms of coal expansion. In 2016, the coal expansion in the country, in Southeast Asia in particular, in general, where the Philippines is part of, have peaked at 12, almost 13 gigawatt. But since then, it has slowed down. And in the first half of 2019, the only coal plant that were, was built was in Indonesia uh, with around 1.5 gigawatt. So the whole of Southeast Asia resistance by NGOs, communities, environmentalists have clearly picked up since 2016. Uh, in the Philippines, since 2018, there has been no new coal plants that were built. Uh, a lot of the cases that were filed in 2016 and resistance have gone at the national level. There are many reasons for this, but one of the key reasons is that at the national level, all coal plants that are in the pipeline and at the same time, all existing coal plants are being resisted by communities. Uh, thousands of communities have uh, joined many actions, nationwide actions in the country. Uh, just recently, in 29, September 2019, we launched the, a National Day of Action Against Coal. And correspondingly, because of the cases that were filed and at the same time the push for uh, renewable, prioritizing renewable energy, the price of renewable energy since 2016 have gone down drastically. It is now around 0 0.048 pounds compared to 0.16 pounds of coal per kilowatt hour of electricity. So the, the coal plants cannot, can no longer argue that they're cheap, unlike before, that it's so hard because renewable energy was, so, was still so high. Remarkably, in 2018, finally, the current president, many are not fond of him, including most of the anti-coal campaigners here in the Philippines. But for the first time in his State of the Nation address, from the years of campaigning and uh, you know, the resistance of communities against these coal plants, as well as the expansion of renewable energy and the reduction of prices and many others, he finally declared a policy and has asked the Department of Energy Secretary to fast track the development of renewable energy sources and uh, limit our dependence to fossil fuel such as coal. So it's a matter of political will now uh, in terms of how would the Department of Energy act on this new policy. But still, if you look at the pipeline 
and you know where the money is at those that are behind the whole expansion will still push through with it and remarkably just last week no early this week three days before the global earth day ayala one of the biggest company declared the their abandonment of coal investment by 2030 of course that we're still pushing them that why 2030 that's quite long still but Ayala have been targeted by the campaign more than five years now, and they have progressively reduced their coal dependence. So there's hope there. Uh, but coal developers are still really persistent, just like San Miguel Corporation, and uh, in adding more coal fleets and adding more problems to uh, the already suffering communities and, and the environment. So in a nutshell, Today, Southeast Asia is turning into a key battleground against coal. 15% of the global coal expansion is in Southeast Asia and led by Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, as well as Burma. So this could be a very critical battleground where the final nail of the coffin for coal can actually be dictated. I'll end there. Thank you so much. Jerry and Heffa for your presentation. I have a first question to Jerry myself. So I have heard that in the Philippines, or the Philippines are a heaven for renewable energies. So why are companies even still planning to build coal plants there? And what would be possible in the Philippines in terms of renewables? Before 2016, uh, we already have a law uh, for renewable energy. So it's a 10-year law. Uh, it just turned 10 years, one decade last year. Uh, so if, uh, despite the existence of the law, it has went to the reverse. Um, uh, imagine 10 years ago that uh, renewable energy share is around 35% of the overall power mix. Now it's around more or less it moves around 30 to 31 percent. So it does, it's, it has reduced because of the coal avalanche. Um, one of the reasons is that for the coal expansion was that the, the Department of Energy has dilly dallied in the, in the implementation of the new law. Uh, in 2015, uh, from 2013 to 2015, only two policies out of the 10 policies mechanisms, policy mechanisms under the law was implemented. So it took almost eight, eight years uh, before they implemented the two uh, first policy. Um, so that's why in 2016, we thought that the citizens needs to act. Uh, and so we sue the Department of Energy to the Supreme Court in 2016. Uh, we went with the uh, affected communities of the coal plants and sued uh, the Department of Energy for the non-implementation, the full implementation of the renewable energy law. Since the 2016 uh, implementation, uh, the filing, four new mechanisms were implemented. Uh, so you can uh, link the new policies with the dwindling prices and the expansion of renewable energy. That was the theory before. Uh, and one of the key reasons uh, which is not being talked about is because there's a lot of lobby by corporations, um, mainly by the likes of San Miguel Corporation and many others. Uh, that's a known fact uh, in the Philippines, but you, know, you, you cannot uh, write, it, write it in newspapers. But everyone knows uh, that corporations lobby governments uh, and the fact that the, the, the Philippine government has dilly dallied in the implementation and it has caused a lot of harm already with the establishment of coal plants. Could you maybe just elaborate a little bit more on how people are already opposing coal? So you've, coal, so you've already filed a lawsuit, um, you're doing small scale activism, um, you have the highest death rate of land owners in the world, which is really terrible. So. Could you maybe just elaborate a bit more on the tactics and the strategies you're already using and what you're already doing? Because of the political climate, 
which is a big consideration in terms of the Philippines. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we call them, uh, you know, the, the, the cliques or the elites in particular provinces. There's always like that. And most of the time, they, they used to be warlords. Uh, so the, the, the usual guns, gold, and you know, that stuff is, is still uh, prevalent. Um, so one of the key elements uh, for the upswing of resistance is to link all the communities, to make them feel that they're not alone. Um, so that was the, the major endeavor that uh, the, com the campaign undertook uh, from 2012 to 2015, uh, because it was so hard to campaign then on a per project basis because uh, you know it's it's still young the movement was still young and because of the political terrain it's problematic so a national campaign is uh, critical uh, to empower the communities and to make them feel stronger uh, eventually we've evolved some of the, the a lot of strategies like filing uh, law cases just last year I think we filed around five cases uh, per two projects and policies. Uh, so it has really picked up. Uh, one other strategy that we found that is very critical is to link the coal plant issues with community issues on pollution, on uh, harassment with the consumers. Uh, in 2019, that was the the major, a major breakthrough for us. Uh, so we did basically focus on the work from 2017 to 2019 to develop a conscious uh, consumers movement that, hey, coal is not just dirty, it is also costly. So it's a painstaking uh, explanation to consumers in Metro Manila, to the city, that the coal plants are not just problematic in terms of uh, you know, pollution and uh, death rates in, in, in destroying the climate and environment. Because most of, most of the time, uh, consumers here in Metro Manila, you cannot mobilize them. And, and because if you create that public opinion in the cities, it's more formidable. So we have to find ways how to, to raise that consciousness. And so we thought that prices of electricity, because of the high price of electricity in the Philippines, that it's mainly caused by imported coal because we import 70% of our coal resources. Uh, sorry, it's more than 70%. Uh, and mainly from Indonesia and many other countries. So imagine that being dependent to imported products, which are costly, are actually the main reason why we have uh, electricity, uh, high cost of electricity. I'd like to ask Heffer, what would an effective exclusion policy look like for Standard Chartered? Like, what does Standard Chartered need to do in order to stop funding companies that, for example, are responsible for these, for these devastating impacts in the Philippines? Standard Chartered needs to have much tougher rules on corporate lending and also on um, corporate investment banking. I mean, um, RBS shows that it can be done. Royal Bank of Scotland, they're using a 15% threshold. There are plenty of other banks who are already using a 30% threshold, always looking at coal share of revenue, or a 25% or even a 20% threshold to exclude coal companies. And it's absolutely unreasonable in my mind that Standard Chartered says, oh, well, we'll start excluding some of the corporate finance next year and we'll start at 100%. There are actually very few coal companies that have 100% coal share of revenue. And um, Standard Chartered, I mean, if, you know, if we think climate emergency, a climate emer emergency was declared by the parliament in the UK, I mean, Standard Chartered's policy, it doesn't, it's like they're living on another planet. They're not acting in, in the speed or um, uh, in the, with the ambition that is actually needed, which is, I mean, coal is the part of the fossil fuel industry, which is easiest to let go, which is easy to replace, which shouldn't, shouldn't be there anymore. And um, 
bankrolling these projects in the in the in the Philippines or the companies behind the projects in the Philippines and companies like Adani, it's um, there need to be massive protests on this. And I actually, in that context, have a question to Jerry. Have uh, the Philippine movement? I mean, Standard Chartered is. You know, their presence in the UK is, they're not that well known actually, because there's so much a bank in the emerging economies. Have there been protests in the UK, in, in, in the Philippines like, directly? I mean, Standard Chartered, I'm sure also has offices in the Philippines and has a, a, a presence in Metro Manila. And if there hasn't, just a suggestion for the future. We haven't really, uh, to be honest, uh, but, we we it's it's part of the plan uh for this year uh in fact we've launched uh the uh probably the first divestment campaign uh in a uh, developing country we just launched it uh recently uh so we are we will be uh protesting uh in the standard charter uh, offices here we are We'd love to coordinate with, with the UK campaigns. That's amazing. I think that's a perfect way to end this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heffa and Jerry.